As we continue in our Made Well sermon series, we think about healing in the way Jesus healed many people in Scripture and how we might find healing in our lives today. So far, we've heard of Jesus curing a man possessed by demons, the curing of a hemorrhaging woman, and Jesus compelling a young woman who had died, the daughter of Jairus, to rise and get up. Today we look again at the Gospel of Mark, which contains a different kind of healing miracle than what we've heard in the past few weeks. Healing takes place, but in a different way. Let us listen to what the Spirit is saying to us in our passage today. <clears throat> the apostles gathered around Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. He said to them, Come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a deserted place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them, and they hurried there on foot from all the towns and arrived ahead of them. As he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. When it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place, and the hour is now very late. Send them away so that they may go into the surrounding country and villages and buy something for themselves to eat. But he answered them, you give them something to eat. They said to him, Are we to go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? And he said to them, How many loaves have you? Go and see. When they had found out, they said, Five and two fish. Then he ordered them to get all the people to sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to his disciples to set before the people, and he divided the two fish among them all. And all ate and were filled. And they took up twelve baskets full of broken pieces and of the fish. Those who had eaten the loaves numbered five thousand men. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> I'll begin with a staggering fact. We now produce enough food that every person on planet Earth should have enough to eat. Think about that for a second. We produce enough food on our planet that everyone should have enough to eat, according to an article from the United Nations Environment Program. That is a mind-blowing fact to me. But I also have a couple of questions. So if we have enough food for everyone, why are people then going hungry? Why are 10% of people hungry, 25% of people overweight or obese due to a lack of healthy food options available, and another 25% of people underfed or overfed due to a micronutrient deficiency. Now, we learned a lot in seminary, but I had to look up what a micronutrient uh, deficiency was and how it affects the body. <clears throat> it is essentially a lack of essential vitamins and minerals, which can lead to anemia, or reduced red blood cell count, which can lead to several negative health effects like fatigue, weakness, shortness of breath, and dizziness. These effects can lead people to be malnourished. The challenge we face today is not in a lack of food. We've crossed that threshold. The challenge lies in the efficiency so in this case, I mean the process that begins at the farm and ends at our kitchen tables. 
from the growing to the harvesting to the shipping to the selling of food until it ends up at our places of dwelling. Around one-third of all that food that is produced is lost and wasted in the areas between farm and table. Each year, around 1.3 billion tons of food is lost or wasted each year. Friends, that is a lot. Food that could sustain, nourish, and give life to those who lack the means to live abundantly. But for the first time in human history, when it comes to food, we could all have enough. Which brings us to our scripture passage today. Jesus and the disciples are arriving to a deserted place in order to rest and eat and finally relax. They are followed, however, by the crowds who see where they are arriving and hurried ahead of them. Verse 34 reads, As he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd, and he began to teach them many things. I'm not so sure about this compassion thing. I've been to some pretty crowded spaces. I'm sure many of you have been to the Panthers Stadium. Have you ever been to Trader Joe's on a Sunday? (laughs) Compassion for those large crowds? I don't think so. At least not for me. I'm more likely to get frustrated, irritated, annoyed, and that's just being in the store. Forget finding a place to park. These are feelings of a self-serving interest, something we'll talk about in a moment. But going back to this idea of compassion, that is important to our story today. It is through this compassion that the people are taught. Jesus saw them as sheep without a shepherd. Sheep, by their nature, are creatures in need of someone or something to guide them, like a shepherd. And so they followed him, saw where he would get off the boat, and settled down in a deserted place, a place of food insecurity, with many mouths to feed, but nothing to feed them with. In a very human moment, the disciples are the first to wonder about food. You may remember in verse 31, they were told, to go and find a place to rest and eat, but they haven't been able to do that yet because of the crowds. I would imagine at this point the disciples are getting pretty grumpy um, and are a little hungry. In fact, I might be adding a word to your personal dictionary today. I'll introduce the word hangry. Hangry. To be angry because you're hungry. So the disciples are hangry. There are well over 5,000 people in the vicinity in a deserted place, but it could have been even more. A quick biblical note, in those days only men would have been counted. It makes perfect sense that they were far more present for Jesus' teachings like women and children. Therefore, there's a chance that there's actually way more than 5,000 people in attendance. So that is a lot of mouths to feed. If you've ever had the privilege to be on any youth trip, and I honestly mean privilege, our kids are amazing, you know how important it is to have food readily available to those who are starting to wonder what the next meal might be. Now the disciples want to send them away for themselves, to fend for themselves, and Jesus responds with what I can only imagine to the disciples is a maddeningly unhelpful answer. You give them something to eat. You give them something to eat. I wonder if we followed this command, if the amount of food wasted would still equal 1.3 billion pounds of food. 
every person would be able to have enough? The disciples' answer is the same answer to the world's oftentimes. How are we to pay for all of this? Someone else will do it. Why should it be us? Why should we do it? I'm sure it seemed to the disciples that there wasn't enough. They collected only five loaves of bread and two fish, after all. Hardly enough to feed 12 people, let alone over 5,000. To the disciples, the personal cost to feed all of these people was too much. The time and energy and resources to feed these folks would leave them with not enough. The time and energy and resources to feed those in our world today would leave us with not enough. But would it really? We have enough. So where does this fear come from? There's a word to describe this feeling. The word is scarcity. And it sounds a little something like this. Well, if I give of my time and resources and money, then I won't have enough. If I give away my food, what will my family eat? If I give away some of my money, then surely I won't have enough to provide for myself. Our daily lives are built around the idea of enough and if we have that for ourselves. But we could take this, we could take the glass half full, half empty concept and replace it with the mindset of scarcity and abundance. Scarcity is a false idol. Scarcity is also a feeling, a mindset, dare I say, an illness. It leads to greed, to selfishness, to feelings of unfairness and a sense of personal injustice in the world. This mindset has people clamoring to have more than enough and keep what is theirs. But thank God there is another way. Abundance is the opposite of this. Knowing that there is enough and that we have all we need and then some. Our cup overflows. I don't fault the disciples for their response. Mark tells us quite a few times that they don't totally understand who Jesus is and what Jesus can do. For them not to put their faith in Jesus, that they would be able to feed all of these people, is understandable. Mathematically, that's a seemingly impossible thing to do. Now, I got curious, and some people did do the math. On the internet forum known as Reddit, people actually took the five loaves and fish and calculated how much each person would get. I couldn't do it. But I like this example. If they believed that there was a scarcity of food, then each person ate one one-thousandth of a loaf of bread, or somewhere around 0 0.8 grams. That's not a lot. But that's the scarcity mindset that comes from a fear of there not being enough for all, and so as a result, people go very hungry. Instead, Jesus sits the people down, he blessed and broke the loaves, and gave them to his disciples to set before the people, and divided the two fish among them all. Abundance, having more than enough. In a seemingly impossible situation, a situation of perceived scarcity, Jesus invited the people to view that they had something not to be clung to as tightly as possible, but something to share, something to spread to one another, a way of viewing life in abundance, abundance not in what they have, but in what they see. It's hard to imagine a life of abundance, 
especially when we live in a world that calls us every day to want more. Get the new iPhone or the newest face mask thing. Drive the new car, wear the newest thing, drink out of the coolest cups, go to the most popular concerts, get the newest streaming service, travel to the farthest places, donate to this candidate or that one. If you have children, take them to the nicest schools and the list goes on and on and on. And soon enough, we are drained of our time, our energy and our money. We feel the encroaching feeling of scarcity when we desire more. So we hold on tighter. We don't count our blessings, but rather we count our material wealth. We don't see the ways that God is providing for us, but the ways that the world is taking from us. When this happens, we only think of the ways in which we have to sacrifice for others. When this happens, we allow over a billion pounds of food to go to waste. We allow others to go hungry. And let me be clear, there is very real hunger in this world. There are people who are literally starving, devoid of nutrients. That is a real fact. I'm speaking about the concept of scarcity. The perceived notion of not having enough that creates a sense of greed in us that lets people to be hungry and leads people to be hungry. <clears throat> this doesn't have to be our reality. I invite you to a new way of living. I invite you to take a peek behind the curtain and see what living a life of trusting in God's abundant love looks like a life of faith, a life of joy, of enough for all. The ending of the story in verse 42 through 44 reads, And all were ate and filled, and they took up twelve baskets full of broken pieces and of the fish. Those who had eaten the loaves numbered five thousand men. All ate and were filled. Twelve baskets of leftovers were taken up. Abundance. Enough. Their hunger was healed. A level of scarcity met with abundance and the people were full. And thinking of feeding people as a way of healing might seem sort of strange, might seem an abstract concept. <clears throat> but our research from the beginning says otherwise. Starvation, true starvation, leads to the body shutting down with an inability to function. Feelings of dizziness, differing heart rates too fast or too slow, thirst, and more. I think we could apply some of those feelings to a spiritual hunger as well. Could you imagine how folks would respond if we use this in our communications? Warning, failure to go to church and sign up for Lent groups and send in your pledge and attend each Sunday a year might result in feelings of spiritual dizziness, thirst for spiritual nourishment, and a feeling of hunger in your life for community, love, and acceptance. I'm no expert in communications, as you can tell. I'll leave that to our excellent team here. But I do wonder how we might feed others how we might reach into our abundance to make the places of scarcity feel full. I have a few ideas about this. Today is a day in which we partake in communion, a day in which we are fed and all are welcome to the table. Today is Scouting for Food Sunday, a day in which we are called to feed others a cycle of feeding and being fed for ourselves and others, a way of shifting our thinking of abundance and scarcity, knowing the ways in which we are made well by God and everyone is fed, everyone is full. May it be so. We have the food to do so, we have the resources May we all be a part of that change. 
May we all see our lives not just in terms of wants and needs, but in the abundant way God has healed our hunger for love, our hunger for justice, our hunger for acceptance in who we are. It's my prayer that the Spirit moves in each of us to be able to address the hungers of the world. It's my prayer that we see our lives through the abundant ways God is present in our lives. May all be fed. May all be full. Amen.